Hey everyone, it's Caitlin here from Divers Alert Network, and we are back with another webinar. Today I'm here with three of Dan's doctors, and uh, for those of you who may not be super familiar with our doctors, these guys are working behind the scenes every time somebody makes an emergency phone call to Dan, or if people just call for a medical information inquiry. So likely you guys would be end up dealing with them on the phones, but they're also doing a lot of other work behind the scenes, which we'll get to here in a minute. Um, but just to give a brief introduction, we're here with Dr. Jim Chimiak. He is our chief medical officer. Hello, everyone. And uh, we're also here with Dr. Matias the director of medical services. Who are you? Perfect. And we're also here with Dr. Camila Sariva. He is the assistant director of Dan Medical Services. Hi, everyone. So in a minute here, we're going to get to our presentation, and they're going to pretty much everything you need to know. And right after we're done with that presentation, we're going to get to a question and answer report. So if you guys have questions, which I'm sure you all do, go ahead and throw us a comment, and we can at the end of the presentation. But I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Matias. And Thank you. Okay, so here we go. Let me start the slideshow. Okay. So, diving after COVID. So, what we think divers should know so far, based on what we know, right? So, what is COVID-19? COVID-19 is the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. So, that's why COVID, coronavirus disease 2019. SARS-CoV-2 is a new virus of the family of the coronaviruses. This was first identified in December 2019 in the city of Wuhan in China. And it is responsible for the current pandemic we're all immersed in, the COVID-19 pandemic. So far, in 188 countries, there has been 5.6 million cases and over 350,000 fatalities worldwide. So this is where we are now. So things are not looking good, but at least we know they don't seem to be worsening. This is the number of new cases ever since this started. And these are the number of deaths. Again, it seems to show that there is a tendency to decrease. So that is something that we are happy about, and we hope it continues that way. So what is COVID-19 and what is uh, this coronavirus? Well, this, what you see here, this is actually the culprit. This is the virus itself. Now, the name corona, corona in Latin means crown. So if you pay attention and you have some imagination, you can understand that maybe this looks like a crown seen from upside, right? So this is a tiny, tiny structure between 0.06 to 0.14 microns. Just to give a perspective on the size of this virus. So here we have the virus itself. And what you see here, this red blood cell, that's how it compares the virus to the cell. So this is several times smaller than an average bacteria and a few times uh, smaller also than a red blood cell. Again, to give perspective, if a red blood cell is about the size of a Volkswagen, the coronavirus is about the size of a rat. So it's a really, really tiny structure. But so what is a virus? A virus is a submicroscopic pathogen. It can, viruses can infect all forms of life. They are a biological entity, but they are not a living organism. Its evolutionary origin is unclear, and we can't say that a virus is alive or dead. They're actually active or inactive, and they can only be active once they are inside a living cell. And they can only replicate inside a living cell. So what we see here, that is the coronavirus or a coronavirus. We see those spikes. These are really, really important in both the pathogenesis and maybe a way to prevent infection. And then you have some other proteins on the surface of their membrane. And then they have the genome. And the genome in this case is packed with some proteins. So as you can see, the virus is just that. There's nothing else. There are no uh, enzymes, no metabolic activity, nothing. So, in essence, a virus is an intracellular parasite. They need a cell to use the cell machinery to replicate. They use the nutrients, their enzymes, everything to just keep on replicating themselves. 
Some viruses will kill the cell in the process because they deplete them from nutrients, and some other viruses, they make it hostage, and they continue replicating the cell until eventually we get immunity or uh, we outgrow the disease. So there are two types of viruses. Uh, we have the naked viruses and enveloped viruses. Coronaviruses are enveloped viruses. And this is important because at least what we know from regular enveloped viruses, they tend to be less resistant to adverse environmental conditions. You have seen previous talks uh, from Dan about um, surface survival of these viruses and why it is so important to eventually modify the, the environment to get rid of them. So all different types of viruses, and as we can see, eventually all of them, they either have a lipid membrane or they don't have the envelope, the lipid membrane. So what is that envelope? That envelope is actually part of the last cell the virus infected. So when they make uh, when they make this slave uh, this cell a slave, they take part of the cell membrane and eventually they express their own proteins on the surface to allow them to infect another cell. So those proteins you see on top of the cell or the virus, they are key because they are actually a key. They help the virus uh, find other cells and eventually infect them. So this is what happens, right? The virus touches a receptor, a specific receptor, and bang, you got infected. So both enveloped viruses and non-enveloped viruses, they have the same way. They do rely on those proteins on the surface to eventually get inside the cell and do what they have to do. So these proteins are likely what is going to be used to develop uh, vaccines. Currently, there is no vaccine, several trials on the way. There is a lot of research in terms of coronavirus all over the place. Servers on journals are being uh, filled up with, with stuff that is pending review for, present, for, for publication. So from now on, please keep in mind, you all know things are changing as we speak. So everything we say here might actually change. So keep in mind and keep well informed. So as you already know, symptoms, they usually or they seem to be present within 2 to 14 days post uh, contact with the virus, post infection. And the most common symptom is, of course, fever or chills, and then loss of appetite, fatigue, which is so far no different than a regular uh, flu. And then eventually with some flu, we may have some respiratory symptoms, coughing, shortness of breath, sore throat, muscle pains, loss, loss of smell or, or taste. That is something that has been recently added to the list of possible symptoms for COVID-19. And there may be others. Now, all these symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and cardiovascular symptoms, they all respond to the virus can find that ACE2 receptor in many different organs and organ systems. Now, serious symptoms include trouble breathing, pain or pressure in the chest, new confusion, decreased alertness, and bluish lips or face. In terms of contagion, how, for how long can you keep on spreading the disease to others? Well, it is probably safe to say that within 14 days post-symptom onset, and this is conservative, you people may no longer be spreading the disease to others. Now, it is important to remember that most people are asymptomatic, so they may be spreading the disease without showing any symptoms. It would be easy to, to not get the disease if all you see is sick people. Well, you don't get near sick people. But again, since we don't know who is sick, that's who is sick. That is why we ended up in this lockdown, right? So vulnerable patients, older adults, 65 years old or older, people with asthma, people with diabetes, those that have that are or have some sort of immunocompromission, HIV positive or AIDS, uh, organ transplant, uh, cancer treatments, all these people they have at a higher risk. Uh, those at risk for severe illnesses like cardiac hypertensive, those that have chronic kidney disease or are under dialysis and liver disease. Now, keep in mind, if you have someone who is immunocompromised, they may have a different presentation. Why are we saying this? You may have a family member that is at risk, so don't expect them to show all the same symptoms we just reviewed. If you have someone who is immunocompromised, most likely, or chances are, he or she may not show a fever. 
So they don't have a fever. You don't suspect they're sick. They do have a cough. And then when you send them to the hospital and they do some x-rays, they lungs may be in terrible condition. So please keep that in mind. In terms of prevention, we think we know it spreads person to person. So social distancing was the first thing we implemented. It seems to spread more efficiently than influenza, but fortunately less than measles. So then the next thing we did was mm -hmm, good hygiene. As always, we recommend soap and water, and if these are not available, then hand sanitizer. It is important for people to know that hand sanitizer is not the right thing to do or the first thing to do. Soap and water, good old soap and water, is much more effective in washing out this, uh, this virus. When you don't have soap and water, then hand sanitizer could be a good solution, although it doesn't clean. It just eventually deactivates the virus. And then we ended up with PPE. We know that maybe we need to go one step further. And then we realized that we actually need to be in isolation and lockdown. So, but it may also spread via indirect contact through contaminated objects. And I'm sure that most of you are doing what everybody else is doing, which is in the paranoia, we end up bleaching the stuff we bring from the supermarket. It's not a bad thing, but we may be overkilling. We all like to do it if you can just keep on doing it because, again, things may change. So other ways of getting the virus, like we said before, touching surfaces and objects, it is possible, but it doesn't seem to be the main way this virus spreads. Contacts between animals to people, a few pets have tested positive. Currently, the risk of spreading from animals seems to be low. Again, keep in mind or keep, if you have a pet and you're concerned, uh, keep an eye on the CDC website because things may change. And people to animals. It appears that humans can indeed infect some animals, but it's not so clear if the other way around would work as well. So SARS-CoV-2, so the virus and the lungs. We know that, as with any other flu, when somebody sneezes, when you are sharing a very close environment and you can breathe somebody else's smell, that is probably not a good thing. Now, we all know that if somebody spits on you, that is not good. Now, not necessarily we need to be concerned about the big droplets of, of uh, spit. It's the microscopic droplets that are actually of concern to the point that some people are, or some scientists are now uh, uh, saying that this may actually be spread through just uh, talking, right? Sharing the same space or a close environment and just talking near somebody else. Now, remember when I said that, uh, when I made this comparison, it is fair to say that the virus itself doesn't travel by itself, just naked. It needs a droplet of saliva, right? So this is why we insist on PPE, and there's so much talk about PPE. Uh, anything that you could use is better than nothing. Even a bandana is better than nothing because at least the bandana can stop your own spit from spreading it to somebody else. It may not stop the virus, but again, the virus travels in droplets, and droplets can be significantly larger, larger than the virus itself. We're not supporting or, or endorsing uh, cheap PPE, but again, anything is better than nothing. So COVID on the lungs, like many other viruses, SARS-CoV-2 can cause pneumonia. The virus reaches the lungs traveling through these tiny droplets that we get them through our mouth or inhalation. Now, this virus is in the cells, in the airways and the alveoli. They find these receptors and eventually they invade the cells. This causes either direct killing of the cell or via immune response, that is self-destruction. The symptoms, we talked about this before, and eventually the largest damage seems to happen as a result of our immune system's response to the infection. So white blood cells are trying to wall off this, uh, this infected cells, these infected cells, yes, and they release these substances called cytokines. Some of you have probably heard about this cytokine storm. So cytokines are immune modulators. Uh, they are mediators, and they tend to modulate the immune response. So this causes inflammation, swelling, and the inflammation causes leakage of fluid into the alveoli. And when this happens, oxygenation is severely impacted. So what you see here on the left, that is a normal lung. That's a normal x-ray of someone who is just fine. 
And what you see here on the right is the lung of someone with a very serious lung caused by COVID-19. So let's look at the lungs, what they are. So, so this is a color enhanced uh, uh, scanning of the lungs. So what you see here, I don't know if you can see the cursor, but those are the capillaries. And inside those capillaries, we see these bulging things. Those are red blood cells. So the red blood cells are going one by one in a line inside the capillary to get in close contact with the air. We would be actually standing in the alveoli and watching these red blood cells passing by. So you see the membrane is transparent. The membrane is absolutely tiny, really, really thin. So anything that makes that uh, membrane thicker will severely impact oxygenation. Here, that's a histological uh, preparation of the lung. And again, this is actually one red blood cell in a capillary, and this is the alveoli. Anything that can make those membranes thicker will severely impact oxygenation. And these are the type of cells that the virus is looking for. So the lungs are very, very delicate organs. Inflammation can eventually lead to fibrosis, and which causes stiffness and impacts uh, proper function. And it may also, the, all the swelling, all the cicatrization, all the healing may cause areas of poor ventilation, which for us divers are indeed a big concern. So this is not good for life, and it's not good for diving either. What you see here is a, a 3D model of a lung of COVID. So what you see there on yellow, that is damage. And that yellow is actually pus. So as you can imagine, this is not good for anybody's lungs, let alone diving. This could be serious. So COVID-19 and scuba. So a lot has been said. At some point, we even thought that we had the, the, the answer to COVID-19, right? So the lungs and COVID pneumonia, like any other respiratory illnesses, COVID can cause lasting lung damage. Acute lung injury can take several months to stabilize, not to heal, not to resolve, just to stabilize. Lung damage can only be assessed after stabilization. And at this point, there are no COVID recovered lungs that we can know or assess, well, this is what happens, right? Everybody that has had COVID so far, even if someone had COVID in January, their lungs are likely still recovering. So it is yet too soon to, to say if they are or are not going to be able to die. So COVID-19 pneumonia occurs in only a fraction of those infected. And the ARDS-like syndromes, which is the, the worst presentation of this COVID-19, those cases are even fewer. This is not to say that we shouldn't be paying attention because the numbers are too small. Uh, this is concerning anyway. Even though the numbers are small, this is concerning anyway. So as scientists discover more about how COVID affects sick and recovered people, we continue to advance our general knowledge on how it could affect divers. So, so far, we must be prudent and we need to be really, really patient. Jim. Hi. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Chimiak. I'm the chief medical officer. And uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, essentially uh, give you straight talk. I mean, j exactly what's happened with COVID. Uh, in addition to my duties at Dan, I'm also an anesthesiologist uh, in a community hospital. And we are dealing with an active uh, COVID uh, population that we're dealing with uh, from our assisted living homes and that sort of thing, and, and some of the uh, folks with underlying medical conditions. So the uh, this is widespread throughout the world, and certainly uh, we need to uh, talk uh, straight about this. We want to give you know some good ad advice here today. We don't want to add to the confusion, but rather just give some information that is uh, direct and, and to the point and limit that confusion. Um, and also want to, uh, as I'm talking here today, is also give you some really good changes that may be occurring to uh, diving as a whole, medicine as a whole. So as that comes upon, I'll introduce that, um, um, that part of it. So here's an example of the heart of the problem. And this is the lung. This is the capillaries that surround them and the idea of the cardiopulmonary unit. And one of the things we we'll also will talk about is how the blood is actually interacting and becoming part of the uh, things that we're considering closely. 
So uh, the next point would be to summarize this in a pretty succinct slide here. And this is these are the issues. These are the five issues, the first one being prevention. And we've given enough. I think we've had a couple webinars on this and how to disinfect and the idea of going after disinfecting and eliminating the virus. Um, this is a great point because going forward, it's not just COVID. This should be something that should have been done a long time ago. It's interesting to see some People say, hey, I have not uh, done disinfectant before, or, or, you know, how do you disinfect? Almost scary to believe. But the idea is you have to have a, uh, to cover a whole host of microbes that are out there. So the idea that now we're raising consciousness by this, that may, we may have a better response going forward. We're distancing, we're masking, and we're taking the at-risk population and, and putting them away. We're quarantining them while, this, uh, while measures are being taken to make things safe. It's a balance of risk. And, you know, benefit the idea. Can we stay all of us quarantined versus moving out and doing things? And it's those measures that are a, move, a bit moving target. It may be confusing to folks, but it's really skilled public health officials that are coming together and coming up and saying, when can we release? When can we let people return? When can we open up things? So it's a very complex dance that we're uh, undergoing now. And it's done by some very uh, talented individuals. Uh, the second part is the contagion, and that's just what it says. We want to limit those that are contagious and put them or keep them away from the general population. More understanding about how contagion uh, spreads and also when someone's contagious, you know, where is that time interval? And uh, as we get that uh, be a, more, uh, a better handle on that, in addition to actually doing testing, I think that will be a very um, uh, fruitful area of intervention. Um, the infection itself is where I do my work at the hospital and, and, and folk, mo folks do as far as treating folks. Uh, basically, it's supportive. And that is basically getting someone and allowing their own bodily uh, defenses and their own health to get them through the problem with our assistance to help, uh, um, you know, for things even as, as simple as giving some supplemental oxygen to fluids to even ventilation. Um, that is something that is uh, um, that is uh, uh, evolving. There was a look at some various medications, many have been forwarded, look promising, and then have hit the dustbin. Uh, others still, there's some that do help. As you know, antivirals are very difficult to find one that's a, a magic cure similar to an antibiotic. We uh, don't have that. The other is the vaccine, of course, that uh, we all hoped in, in, uh, and looks very promising, maybe by even by year end. Um, so the other uh, uh, problem with the infection is, of course, the complication. You have the infection portion to be able to uh, give advice to, to divers, but it's the complications that you can have while you, while you have the infection. You can get a, a, a secondary infection with a bacterial uh, organism. You can have some of the problems if you were on ventilation. And just being the, just the basic deconditioning all affects someone who's been infected. The recovery itself is a is a uh, uh, phase process. You may be sick enough to be in an ICU or even in a ventilator, but you'll downgrade in the hospital and be discharged while you're still ill, but being uh, covered at home. There are some that are asymptomatic. There are some that will just stay at home, and we're seeing more of that here in the community where nobody goes into the hospital, or not nobody, but a large percentage do not come into the hospital and actually engage in something called a virtual hospital where uh, nurses and doctors communicate with the patient while they're at house and decide whether to bring them in or not. And it's worked out very, very well. And it's another point I'd like to illustrate that this telehealth initiative may give a boon to help uh, remote operations and helping people that are ill. Uh, the other thing is recovery, and that's more complex and more, uh, probably more variable, and it's dependent on the individual, of course, and the uh, course of infection that they had. So we have that aspect of it, and also we have the actual person's recovery as they're convalescing. Once they're turned over and they've convalesced, at this point they're staying with their doctors. They're staying with their intensivists, their hospitalists, their discharged, their family doc. Once they're, they're released to full, you know, or to exercise, they're beginning to exercise. At that point, they, they be, when they reach full exercise capacity, meaning back to where they were at baseline, hopefully, uh, they're released and uh, uh, regarded as a return to, to their uh, normal daily living. That's where they see the return to diving, and that's where the diving doc will be, will be seeing these individuals. And those folks will have... Um, uh, when the dot, when a diving doc, when I see this individual, you'll have a host of information 
thank God to all the different things, electronic record and things of that nature, that we'll have access to a host of studies that this individual has already seen. There can be various organ systems that got involved or some complications that occurred, in addition to maybe a medical, a underlying chronic medical condition that has to now be taken into consideration and looms larger than it did before. So putting all those things together, the dive doc is then going to make the determination to return to diving. And we're going to look at, um, you know, uh, persons at risk and the idea of actually even going to certain locations during this uh, COVID. So this is a more complex. It, it, medicine has always been more of an individual individual thing. We're all in this together. And what you do may have impact the health of others and vice versa. So we have to uh, look at this also as a big picture as we're, as we're dealing with individuals. We have to also look at the big picture about how this is being transmitted and how it impacts a medical uh, uh, um, system that's remote and maybe challenged to be able to handle even their, um, even their basic uh, um, um, uh, folks in that area. So that becomes an issue too. So um, that is another benefit, and we've talked about three now, is that is the fact that in the past we've uh, not been as uh, 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 strict about folks coming on board a vessel or going diving. Now we're seeing folks that want various uh, checklists for COVID, but this goes for everything else. I mean, cardiovascular risk is so much, is so large in, in uh, our uh, um uh, in our problem, in our fatality base, and in some of the problems we have, is that now maybe we'll start to pay attention to the whole spectrum of problems that come uh, that confront a diver as he comes on board a dive vessel and uh, is uh, 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 interviewed prior to going on board. So uh, these are some of the things that we're talking about, and brings us to our uh, to our next point, which is the uh, the idea of what are we looking at, and for the most part for, for COVID-19, these are the three main areas. So again, I said that you can have complications from the illness and these things certainly have to be addressed, but pulmonary, obviously it's a respiratory disease. It goes into pneumonia, can be complicated by ARDS. Cardiac is becoming a, is a, is a, a area of concern. And that is where there's actually um, a myocarditis or cardiomyopathy that may have occurred as a result. It could also be a complication of just being um, uh, seriously ill and uh, someone with underlying cardiac problems worsened by the disease itself. And final is the cardiovascular, and that's the thromboembolic risk that we're seeing. We are seeing some uh, younger individuals, 50s, 50s, and in, in, uh, in that age group, that we've actually seen some large vessel uh, embolic phenomena that have occurred. There is a, uh, a higher, there is a coagulopathy that is just being understood and being addressed as we speak. Um, anticoagulation is oftentimes being prescribed. That obviously during this period of time is a certain, uh, certainly a, uh, uh, a, a reason for not to, uh, to dive at that time. Um, the um, next point I'd like to make is the actual, and this is where I, I promised you at the very beginning where I did not want to go out and say things that are not, we do not have the facts and to add to confusion. These are questions that are arising and that our medics are getting, and I'd like to address them. Uh, it, 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 you get them so often, I'm hearing the question so often, it reminds me when I was a salvage diver in the Navy, we would pull up, we'd salvage uh, a, a vessel, and the question came in is, oftentimes you, you didn't know it was down there and you couldn't see very well, but you based your salvage efforts on past events, the kind of uh, cable cabling you were going to use, what kind of pumps and this sort of thing that you were going to use, and you use that to attack the problem. Even though you don't know exactly what was down there, you might be doing it by feel and uh, previous experience. And so I'm going to use that kind of logic and, 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 and attack some of these uh, issues. One was oxygen, you know, the, the use of oxygen, the exposure being a concern, and I, I saw some recommendations for it. Uh, first off, I want to predicate it by saying it's never bad to be uh, conservative, especially as you return to diving after a long delay. So obviously, uh, lower exposures, uh, uh, um, um, shallower depths and that sort of thing and, and dives that are not your uh, personal best, that sort of thing is always good. But the idea of limiting oxygen uh, to find a basis for that uh, is difficult because, as you know, in diving, it's a, it's oftentimes a, a, a double-edged sword. I mean, you decrease oxygen exposure, you may increase your decompression risk. And then the idea is, is oxygen going to be an issue, giving that to someone who has had COVID in the past? And at this point, uh, hard to find evidence for it. In fact, as you all know, and this is a whole, we you didn't want to cover today because it would probably take a whole section, is the idea of using hyperbaric oxygen in the context of acute 
um, a COVID-19 injury, which is a subject of, of great investigation that will be taken up by the UHMS this summer. Uh, endothelial damage, we know that it's because, you know, they, we do see that same ACE2 uh, receptors in, in the endothelium. We do see some uh, endothelial damage and maybe part and parcel for the Virchow's uh, tri triad of, uh, of the coagulopathy that we're seeing. So there is some damage, but we think that uh, uh, the response, the healing um, will be uh, good and uh, perhaps not, a, not an, an issue at all. Uh, more to follow on that. Hypoxia is always talked about, and that's the genuine problem that you hear so much about, the, the reason for supplemental oxygen, uh, various devices, and then even, even uh, the need to be ventilated. Um, this comes up with, uh, with diving itself, and um, it, uh, this is something that does need to be evaluated, and it's part of that process that I, that I mentioned before. When I say when someone's going to return to dive, they're going to do a couple things. They're going to recover. They're going to convalesce. They're going to get their exercise capacity uh, back up to baseline, and they're going to do that obviously under their under the guise of their family physician or their or their physician team, and then they're going to see the diving uh, medicine doc. And the idea of are you up to snuff? Are you able to do this? If we de determine, hopefully it's caught by the family doc. That if we determine that despite all that you've done and you're still having problems, you're breathless, you're still not making the mark investigation is definitely re required. And we, it might be anything from chest x-rays, echocardiograms, CT scanning, PFTs, even uh, you know stress testing uh, in a, a variety of labs that may under, find an underlying problem. But the, the measured approach of a history and physical and then going forward and looking at it uh, from that point of view is wise. There's some folks that are actually having uh, various matrices to do that. Um, and those, uh, uh, they, even the uh, authors of those say that these may change with time as more information is available, which leads us uh, to, the, uh, to the next point um, that I'd like to make today, and that is um, the conditions are improving. Uh, we see it every day. Uh, if you if check in with the news, the vaccines, are, as I said, are being developed uh, at, a, at a fantastic pace. Uh, I'm very optimistic uh, to see some result. Uh, treatments are being developed. Uh, there, there is a promising antiviral now uh, that, that appears to be uh, reasonable or add some uh, benefit. There's the herd uh, immunity that will incur as we get a population that does get infected. Um, the protective measures are now being adopted and people are understanding the use and, uh, and employing these things to help open up and, and allow people to um, interact without uh, uh, imposing undue risk. The disease itself is being better understood and some of the uh, intricacies that first came out that we didn't quite understand. And uh, we are uh, getting to the point where, you know, we get phase reopening and these th this will be very important. And just like I said, when, as we bring the, the vessel up that we salvaged, when we finally bring to the surface, it, it sees the light of day. We see the holes. Now we know why we couldn't do this, why this didn't work. It almost seems the same way as we get more and more information, as we get more information on, on divers who have recovered from COVID. And now we're even having divers that are diving and seem to be doing a fairly uh, do, doing fairly well in doing so and, and not, not uh, reporting any, any problems, which brings us to the idea of the phase reopening and in, in, in the final step, and that is places are reopening, people are going forward, and they're looking at the risk benefit, mitigating those risks and doing such wonderful things as I think uh, 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 just shortly after our, our WebEx here today, uh, we'll be um, launching, uh, SpaceX will be launching and, and joining up with the uh, Space Lab here today. So uh, I would like to go ahead and uh, uh, turn this uh, talk over to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Sariva uh, um, uh, and go over, you know, some of the, and hammer home some of these points, and most importantly, to enlist uh, those divers with COVID-19 infection to contact Dan, both to get information and for us to keep track and, and uh, also talk to you about your infection. And so it advances this um, segment, this, this, uh, the, what does, what, impact does COVID-19 have on, on divers? So I'd like to um, go ahead and solicit that um, um, support from you all also, and thank you very much. Milo? Thanks, Jim. Uh, so the next big thing is what you do. So I had COVID and now I want to go back to diving, what you do. So if you had COVID, the first thing is that you have to keep your focus on your recovery. And keep in mind, your recovery can take from weeks to months. 
once you are fully recovered, you can then get in contact with us and we'll be more than glad to refer you for your fitness to dive test. Uh, in the meantime, continue to monitor the recommendations of your local authorities. And don't forget to follow our information on our website, our media channels, and email. Uh, in the near future, we'll be uh, having a study that is under review right now. And this study, it's a longitudinal study that aims to track uh, divers who had COVID to see what were their symptoms, their manifestations, their treatments, their recovery process, their residual complications, uh, and how to safely return them to diving. Uh, keep in touch, keep uh, following our, our channels for more information. And if you are a diver that recovered from COVID, get in contact with us at medic at dan.org and we can try to see how we can help on this. So now to the phase of questions and answers, I'll turn back to Caitlin. All right, thanks Camille, and thanks Jim and Matias for that, that was an awesome presentation. Um, a lot of good information packed into there, and we've got questions rolling in already that we're gonna get to in a minute. Just to confirm, is my connection a little better earlier? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sorry about that, folks. I've restarted my computer, done it, about everything I know to do on my end. So we'll just take this slow. And again, please alert me if this connection is not working out well. Um, but the first question we have coming in says, um, I heard about a diver who had COVID-19 and has lung damage that is incompatible with diving and can no longer dive. Does that mean that anybody who's had COVID-19 should not dive anymore? Uh, Camilo, do you want to answer this one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we get it. It's a thanks for the question, first of all. And this is a question we get almost every day in a medical line. Um, as we, we said in this presentation, there's no one fully recovered. It's a new disease and it takes long to recover. So no one is fully recovered. Um, and if you had a, a major uh, lung compromise in your, in your COVID infection, you have to be extra careful. It's not automatically saying that you cannot dive any longer. It's something that needs to be uh, assessed in a base, in a, in a case by case basis. Uh, but it, it really is something that uh, needs to be evaluated, mainly the structure of the lungs or any residual damage to the structure of your lungs and any residual damage to uh, the function of your lungs. So both will be assessed by your physician. Uh, we can help your physician in this, uh, in this reasoning with some information about dive medicine and diving physiology. Uh, but you you need to be seen by a physician to be cleared for diving again. And I think all the physicians are, are looking at it from, I think everyone around the world uh, agrees with the idea that there's a mild, a moderate, and severe uh, ramification from this. And so uh, they'll uh, actually, even any algorithm even, even will go uh, looking at toward those individuals that have asymptomatic to very mild symptoms, so those that needed to be uh, taken to hospital, administered oxygen, and those that needed uh, uh, ventilation and uh, a lengthy hospital stay for support. And again, the complications themselves um, is a, uh, a very important thing to look at. So it's it's hard. Uh, I, I know the, the caller would like an answer, but it's always the the issue is uh, the, you'll have to almost take it as an individual basis because you also are going to have to look at the underlying medical conditions and where they worsened or or, or made or, or made uh, uh, unacceptably high to be able to uh, continue diving. Right. So kind of a follow-up question to that would be, what exactly would be the process to return to diving after COVID-19? People uh, need to continually follow up with their physicians and become cleared? And then do they need to do anything on their end personally? Well, that, that goes on to the same question, if I could get this, guys. Uh, you know, And that is the idea of 
there's a course, a hospital course, there's a, uh, whether it's going to be in the virtual hospital or whether you're going to recover at home, whether it's symptomatic, you're going to be following up with your doc. You may just get a study, uh, a test that says, yes, you have COVID, you may be asymptomatic. Most likely you're going to follow up with your symptomatic. physician. He's going to follow you. He's going to advise you uh, just to keep you from being a, 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 a contagious risk. He's going to uh, uh, give you advice as far as quarantining you. On top of that, then you're going to go through the process of recovery, convalescence, and then he's going to go ahead and say, okay, you can begin as a exercise program, get back, get back up to your baseline exercise level. From there, uh, if you achieve these goals, a lot of it, what will happen is then you're going to be released. And then you may decide, hey, I want to go ahead and dive. At that point, you're going to interact either with your primary doc and or your diving physician and decide, hey, can you go ahead and dive at that, at that point? And there may be selective studies that definitely would be indicated under those circumstances. And there'll be some organizations that will require certain studies to be done, even though you may be doing well, you may be even better, your exercise capacity may be even better than it was before you got ill, and you're feeling much better, that some organizations uh, may, may actually require to undergo certain studies. Yeah, we, we, we may see changes and, and things will continue to evolve. Uh, one thing I wanted to add is uh, if someone has had COVID and he or she is unsure, uh, one recommendation we can give is don't just go with it. Well, I'll just keep it shallow. <laughs> no, <laughs> because if your lungs are uh, scarring and you have a compromise, uh, shallow can also be dangerous. So please uh, ask and, and make sure that you're going to be fit to die, but don't assume and just keep it shallow. That's a great point, Matthias. And it kind of uh, goes along with a question we got in from one of our audience members, Pause. He's asking, um, so if there is permanent lung damage after recovery, can divers go back to diving? It's again, depend on the basis and they shouldn't try to justify more conservative diving. To that's, that's, that's the million dollar question. But uh, the, the, the issue you're asking there, Caitlin, is uh, what is the severity of the injury? And sometimes uh, what we'll do is we'll get some, uh, for instance, we'll look at the PFTs or you'll look at, at some mild changes on the lung. If we look at a older diver uh, as we age with time, you'll find changes that aren't there when you're younger. And these things are looked at, they're uh, understood, and, and the person is still goes on to, to dive. It depends on the, how severe those changes are. Uh, that we're we're talking about with this with this particular caller, if the changes are severe enough that we think that there's going to be a risk of of for instance pulmonary barotrauma, or that we find some evidence that indeed there is some uh, uh, problems with gas exchange, and uh, particularly if the person and I like to uh, you know enter this in is is the idea that if someone is into breath hold diving where you do um, confront the issues of hypoxia. Those are going to be very more. They're going to they're going to loom large, maybe even larger than you do with the with the scuba diver. From that point of view, is the fact of that uh, um, uh, hypoxemia that we would be concerned about. And so the intensity of your investigation may be deeper than uh, than uh, one 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 might expect for for any other activity. Gotcha. And uh, we've got a couple questions coming in kind of on the same topic, so I guess I'm going to loop them in together. It has to do with um, divers who are asymptomatic. So if you haven't had any symptoms and you, you don't know if you've had COVID-19, um, do you need to do any extra things before you go back to diving? Should you take a precautionary dive physical before you hop back in the water? This is where I think all three of us need to weigh in, uh, but it's one of those things that we're getting at on the ledge because what should you do? Uh, the prudent thing because of the severity of the illness and the fact it's it's widespread and, and, and this sort of thing is you probably should talk to your doctor because just because you got a one positive test, as you know, it, it could not be accurate. So one thing is to make sure and then also to see if you're infectious. So you should be following up with your physician. I think this is a this is a, a, a disease an infection that you should be followed by your physician and be released by him before you go on to diving. I don't think this is, uh, you should be treated as a common cold. Right, but keep in mind that we have all this uh, palette of cases, right? From someone who is 
was never tested positive and he has no reason to think he or she has ever had a COVID, then we have the ones that did test positive and they don't know anything. I mean, they never, they never had any symptoms. Then we have those that they had COVID, they had symptoms, but they didn't have any significant respiratory issues. Then we have the ones that had a COVID pneumonia. And finally, the ones that had this uh, ARDS type of, of, of cases where they required hospitalization in an ICU and ventilation, of course, those are the ones that have the higher risk of, actually, those are the ones that are lucky if they come out of it. But I mean, in between all those cases, COVID positive won't necessarily mean you can't uh, keep on diving. It depends on the type of case you had and how it impacted. And, and that, that's going to determine if you could just continue diving as if nothing happened, or if the recommendation is, well, you may want to be checked and have some more thorough assessment. Uh, right. And if you are a diver and you are too long from, from your last visit to your physician, from your last checkup, it's always a good idea anyway. <laughs> right. It's a perfect excuse to have that thorough check. I, I, I don't like analogies because they're all usually not completely accurate, but it, you could almost, like in a motor vehicle accident, obviously not an infectious disease, but if someone was to say, can I dive after a motor vehicle accident? And you know, everyone knows that a motor vehicle accident can range from a contusion on the elbow to quite uh, severe injuries that would certainly preclude diving. And what will happen is you're released through care as you march through the process. All those things that happen to you, whether it was from the motor vehicle accident or complications of your treatments, uh, those will all be sized up and they'll be addressed separately. And finally, um, at the end of the line, when you're your physician and the dive medical physician get together, they'll look and see uh, where are you standing when you want to go ahead and proceed and go ahead and, and, and continue diving. So I don't look at, uh, you know, this as being a catastrophic thing, this apocalyptic event, this COVID-19. It's a bad infection, but I don't think we should take it out of context uh, uh, from that as and, and deal with it uh, directly like that, real objective. And as we get more information, as we see um, of uh, asymptomatic divers that tested positive for COVID, definitely had it. And uh, we get the information from folks calling into Dan and we follow, uh, we'll have information that we can talk uh, um, um, more directly and more forcefully with. Gotcha. And kind of some more follow up on these. So here's a couple questions rolling in. Um, do we have any thoughts or recommendations on divers who work commercially? Um, on whether they should get antibody testing before returning to work, or um, on the other hand, for those of us recreational divers, some kind of known exposure or some reason to believe we could have no symptoms um, and no sickness, should they be getting tested for antibodies before they return? Caitlin, this is this is one of the moving targets that you nobody would really want to even touch because the fact is, as we get more and more tests, and they even talk about even having home testing for yourself and that sort of thing. I don't know if it's going to get to that point, but the idea is you're seeing some in some critical in industries now that they're testing the workers to get them on board so that they don't infect others. I would think that commercial diving, you know, the idea of going in bells, I'm I'm certain are as astronauts uh, uh, are uh, have been uh, uh, t I'm sure ha there's been a testing uh, program in and a, a system in, in keeping them in isolation to, to allow them to do their job so I, I my guess is that's going to be something that will be part of the of the uh, paradigm but I can't say that for now because of the lack of widespread testing availability and that sort of thing cost and, and things of that nature but yeah I could see that becoming an issue and certainly with commercial diving or uh, as you pointed out yeah, keep in mind that one thing is recreationally, right? We we have the right to do anything we want uh, within reason, of course. Now, when it comes to commercial, there are other things at play there. So there is responsibility from the employer. So these are the things that most likely we will see changes. And I don't think it's prudent for us or anybody to say at this point, well, this will happen or this won't happen. Things will likely continue to evolve and we will surely know. And those that are commercial divers, rest assured that all the, the authorities having jurisdiction will let you know what you need to do before returning to time. Perfect. All great stuff to know. Um, I just want to go ahead and throw out there, guys, we're getting a lot of questions about gear disinfection 
and uh, protocols to follow about that and uh, people asking if rental equipment is safe. Um, just to let you guys know, we've done an entire webinar series on uh, gear disinfection and I think we have oh, no, issues with the audio. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Let me know. Is it? Am I better now? Let me. It's 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 uh, it's breaking up. But so essentially, what Caitlin was saying is, we have done some seminars here, and we have also on our website. If you go to dan.org/slash/covid19, covid-19, uh, you will find a lot of information about how to disinfect gear, how not to and what works uh, and what we know so far. So please do visit the website. There's a lot of information there. But again, this is one of the benef uh, benefits, if you can say the silver lining, is that now we're all becoming cognizant of of looking after our gear and doing it in an easy, cost-effective manner and keeping our gears clean and, and disinfected. And so we don't have these epidemics that we hear about that are reported of uh, not only just, uh, you know, respiratory tract infections, but GI infections that occur on, on liveaboards or even on larger cruise liners, that maybe there's going to be this uh, more um, intense where everybody thought it was somebody else's job to take care of these things. Now you're going to sit there and say, hey, we're all part of this. And the idea of keeping a cleanliness and cleaning gear and disinfecting ourselves. I've, I've noticed some of the, the uh, training agencies are saying, hey, let's incorporate Incorporate disinfectant amongst the students now, not the instructor staying after hours, hours after cleaning your gear, that they incorporate the students also to learn this uh, process. And so it's one of the, I guess, like I said, one of the bennies uh, uh, that made me, me come of this uh, pandemic. Yeah, and keep in mind also that when it comes to COVID prevention in a diving environment, uh, the most important do, and actually the biggest responsibility is ourselves, us as divers where we go and the questions we ask and what what are we forcing or, or, or encouraging the, 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 the dive operators to do for us to keep us safe, right? And I think what Caitlin was saying when she, she got uh, pixelated <laughs> uh, is that we have an awesome uh, uh, presentation from our risk mitigation group two weeks ago and it's live on, on, it was a, a Facebook Live and, and it's recorded, so you can access this too. Uh, as this presentation is going to be online after we finish, uh, there's this uh, presentation from Risk Mitigation two weeks ago. Take a look at, at this presentation, it's very informative. Right. It's definitely very informative. Um, guys, I just tried switching to audio only. Is this a little bit better? Yes. Clear. So far, it's doing fine. Perfect. So um, a couple people are asking um, how they can use Dan to find a dive physician. Can we go over that real fast? Yeah. This is another thing that we do every day, and it's not just for members, so it's for every diver. Uh, you can call the information line, uh, and you can have the one of the medics, one of us, to to uh, search for you. We have we hold the the largest database of dive physicians in the world. Uh, so call us, we will more than, or send us an email to medic at dan.org, and we'll be more than happy to send you the referrals in your area. Perfect. And we have one more question that, uh, if we can get to you today. So um, Douglas is talking about, um, excuse me, not, Douglas, my bad. I'm sorry, guys. So another question we have coming in um, is coming from the perspective of a dive operator. So um, we have a lot of resources out there, guys, for dive operators um, at dan.org slash COVID-19 about reopening and safe procedures. But this one is more on the medical side. And he's asking uh, if he comes into contact with a uh, COVID-19 recovered diver or a uh, someone who's not necessarily recovered and comes in contact with him or his staff, what precautions should they take um, to keep themselves safe as they're dealing with customers in this reopening phase? This, this question comes on with uh, essentially you're, you're discussing, uh, let's take the worst case, a person with a known case of COVID has symptomatic 
and is in close quarters, uh, broke the uh, uh, distancing, and you've been, say, discussing gear or whatever, and you've been there for a uh, uh, 15, 30, uh, or 30 minutes of exposure face-to-face, uh, uh, many will um, recommend that you be uh, quarantined and subsequently tested as a result of that exposure. Um, the question, uh, and that's, I, I'll probably leave it at that because then you get into the, um, well, uh, it was a person that had talked to a person who had talked to a person, right. and then that gets kind of more complex and it becomes a risk benefit. And then the idea of uh, uh, if, if suspected, I think the most prudent thing to do is to contact your physicians. Most are operating by phone and some using telehealth uh, types of uh uh, procedures and then guide you toward and as testing becomes more available they may be uh, 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 closing down on that large quarantine process and as they start to do testing uh, keep you away from others for that period of time or at least keep you covered and then uh, return you but at, at this point that's the uh, uh, generally accepted uh, CDC guidance we uh, I always hate to uh, do it with a bit of reserve because re as we speak the CDC may be changing the guidance on these things because as i say it's not that it's a moving target it's that the 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 highly skilled professionals that run these organizations are assessing the risk and as the risk goes down or the incidence goes down the need to have some a uh, very uh austere very uh intense uh, um, uh measures become relaxed and you're seeing that with the opening and that's based on the incidents and how successful their their measures are now so i uh, hope it wasn't too wordy on the on the response but that's that's generally the way to, to to deal with that got it a lot of good information there jim um and then i think we have time for one more question so this comes from leo he said he uh tested positive in march negative in may never got hospitalized. Uh, he contacted Dan and we referred him to a pulmonologist and uh, he had an LFT. So, but he's since been cleared to dive by that pulmonologist and he wants to know what the next step uh, with Dan that's needed. The next step with Dan? I don't know what he means by that. <laughs> I, I guess you wanna, what, what's yeah, the next If you part wanna of get in contact with us, send us an email. Right. And as we said about the study that we're going to be doing, you can participate in this study, but uh, it's not it's not something uh, on on the clearance for your dive. I think you are you are cleared already. Nothing that we can help on that. But if you want to participate in the study, keep in touch. We'll be more than glad to put you in. Indeed. Perfect. And go, and go, one final follow-up. One, one uh, quickie is you have to, as you're starting up, please go slow, start off conservative, build yourself up, take a look. Your gear's not been used in a while. You haven't been uh, active in a while. So go ahead and, and, and go ahead and perform some uh, re relatively conservative diving at first just to get yourself back in the water. Um, and that's helpful also if you were to have, begin to have some issues or some problems that were undetected by the investigations that uh, uh, preceded your clearance to dive. So that's what I would do. If there's any untoward type events, certainly report them. Which is true after any disease, right? Serious or not, just take it easy when you go back to diving. And if anything goes out of the normal, stop immediately and get in contact with us and or your physician. Right. All excellent points and information. Um, and then I just have one final question and then we're gonna have to wrap things for today. Um, but can one of you guys elaborate just a little bit more on Dan's study, um, I guess specifically. So if people have had this disease recovered and they wanna give us more information, what happens from there? Is it all anonymized? Uh, just a couple details on that, just to get people excited about maybe wanting to participate in the study, kind of what it means in the future. We we cannot say we cannot say much yet because, as I said, it's under review. But one thing that I can say, and this is valid for any study, uh, it's the highest grade of privacy, and all the information will be uh, kept under the most uh, secure system of of data. So. Don't don't worry about this. Perfect. All right, guys. Well, it looks like that's.
I see. Well, yeah. uh, th thank, thanks everyone for uh, attending this webinar. We really appreciate it. And uh, as you say, stay tuned. I think this story is not over. The book has not been written. And as we get uh, better data, I, I know some fine physicians that are now publishing uh, real results and they're very, very helpful. Uh, oftentimes reversing uh, what you may have read that was quickly and scrambled up on this on the uh, on the uh, internet. Uh, we're getting some great inf great information as we start to build this up. We hope to do the same with specific for divers. And uh, again, thank you for your support and uh, your attention during this. Mateus, Camillo. And, and don't worry, Caitlin is okay. <laughs> <laughs> but so anyway, so thank you very much and hopefully we'll continue doing this, uh, these webinars and providing our two cents. Yeah. Thanks, guys, and Thanks. have a nice weekend. There she is. She's alive. <laughs> have a Hi. nice rest of the week and weekend, and see you next time. Thank you. Be safe.